Hi, everyone. Welcome to Domain Sherpin. Thank you for tuning in to the podcast with the best domain name and digital asset content in the world. Today's episode is a down the rabbit hole show called Health is Wealth, where I'm joined by Jen, Leanne, and Drew, and we talk about some important factors to look at related to the health of domains and what to do if your domains are blacklisted by certain platforms. We also talk about the launch of Afternick Boost and whether broad-based marketing is an effective strategy for selling domains. And since we're talking about the health of the domains in our portfolios, we also talk a little bit about personal wellness too. All that and more is coming up on today's show. And remember, if you're listening to the audio version of this podcast, you can also watch the video version at DomainSherpa.com and on our YouTube channel at DS.TV. You can also listen to the shows on Apple and Spotify and other podcast platforms as well. And please make sure to hit the like button and the subscribe button and all that good stuff everywhere that you can and help Domain Sherpa grow the pie. We also integrate our shows with Muse.ai, which provides search functionality for the shows and transcripts as well. So definitely check all that out. And huge shout out to DNWE, short for Domain Name wholesale exchange it's a trading platform designed specifically for domain investors streamlining the process of buying and selling domain names to make it quicker and easier with a community of over 3,500 investors dnwe enhances market liquidity facilitating more efficient transactions with standard domain listings reverse auctions standard auctions and the soon to be added portfolio auctions including traffic portfolios DNWE is part of EW3N, a family-run digital asset investment company based in London, England that also operates DomainManage.com, which is a global sales platform, and Brandable.uk, which is a marketplace for UK and Co.uk domain names. The DNWE Domain Industry Scavenger Hunt is also officially a wrap. And as the final winners are being announced, please make sure to check that out and see if you're a winner. And thanks again to everybody who participated and everybody who contributed. And last but not least, shout out to our own business, Media Options, the number one domain brokerage in the world, specializing in domain acquisition, sales, and appraisals. Find out more at MediaOptions.com, where you can also sign up for our newsletter for the best domain names and domain opportunities available in the market every week, and also featuring key insights and other helpful information related to branding, naming, and domain investing. With that, it's now time to get into this episode of Domain Sherpa, where all roads lead to domains. So let's jump down the rabbit hole. What's up, Sherpa Network? Thank you for tuning in today. My name is Jonathan Tenemom, aka JT, aka J on, aka Sherpa Winfrey a.k.a. Thunder Mountain, and I'm the host and producer of Domain Sherpa, where all roads lead to domains. Today's show is part of our Down the Rabbit Hole series. As we say here on Domain Sherpa, all roads lead to domains. In the reverse, our work with domains has been venturing all the time into different areas and things, some domain-related, some not-so-related, hence the jump down the rabbit hole. So this show actually started with my homegirl, Jen Sale. What's up, Jen? Uh, describe it as a tech-adjacent digital asset, pop culture, tangent-positive monthly podcast with some domain stuff thrown in for good measure. And, uh, you know, sometimes we bring on special guests and uh, oftentimes what we'll do is we will pick a topic and we will try to dig deep. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Today's today's topic is domain related. So for all you domain maxis, stay tuned in. No need to jump off. But we're going to talk about domain health and some domain due diligence things that you can do to make sure that names that you're buying are actually usable. And, uh, you know, there is no detriment to the value of some of the domains that you might be considering investing in. So uh, so we're going to get into some of that kind of stuff. We're going to get a little technical. Maybe it's going to be a lot of fun. So let's go ahead and over to my right. I got my homegirl, Leanne McMahon, a.k.a. Leanne McMahon Eater. Whoa, here she comes, a.k.a. Steph McMahon, a.k.a. Leanne Rhymes. How do I live? AKA Air Table Jordan, AKA I Stark, AKA Enola Holmes. What's going on, Leanne? How are you? Hey, JT. Yeah, I'm very well. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. See, that's us. What's up? See, you know, we bring guests on all the time. I do this whole thing. I'm like, how you doing? And they're like, I'm just great. Nobody ever asked me how I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate that. You know, that's right. what's up. <laughs> just like, I do. So I'm just talking, We're just talking. All right, let's keep it moving. <laughs> to my lower right, I got my boy Andrew Rosner, a.k.a. Morpheus, a.k.a. the Dirk Diggler of Digital Assets, a.k.a. Bob Lee Swagger, the Sniper, a.k.a. Drew. Drew got what I need, a.k.a. Every Rosner has his thorn, a.k.a. Never Gonna Give Drew Up, a.k.a. Graybeard, the Domain Pirate. What is going on, man? How are you? I'm just curious. What is it exactly that I have that you need? <laughs> I don't know. I was, I was, just, I was just curious. I don't know, man. It just kind of plays into the whole, like, you know, the Bismarcky joint, you know? I was just curious. I was just curious. I don't know, man. That's deep, though. That's no, deep. I'm I'm great. I'm great. I'm great. 
uh, uh, kids are back to school today. Today's officially first day back to school. So getting my rhythm back too, which uh, is welcome. Uh, although I'm really not a, a early morning person. That's just not my jam. And getting up now at 6.30 is... Uh, Ooh. It's, a, it's a, Well, it's affecting my whoop score. I had 11 consecutive days of 100 sleep score. Mm. Uh, and wow. uh, that shit got... Ooh, that shit got kneecapped. My whoop uh, score yeah, got kneecapped. So days, anyways, nice but all in all... Yeah, all in all... Uh, all things are well. I'm 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 pretty excited actually. I'm pretty excited for like, you know, I I was pretty happy with summer, but like I'm kind of excited for it to be over. Get back to the routine. Get back to business. You know, I think it's still going to take another week or two for the gears to start turning. But like, you know, I think we're going to have a, a, a you know, it's going to be it's going to be a lot of it's going to be a lot of movement coming in the next. Well, that's going to get three, interesting. Months, so. All right, cool. Well, that's what's up, man. Well, that is what's up. 11 days, whoop score, perfect score. Does the one day then make it like now you're like wrecked? Or do you think like, have you built up some sleep? Like, you know what I mean? Where one well, day. So not- it's interesting the question you asked because I find that mentality be precisely the problem with these types of things. So is you start relying on it to tell you how you feel and as opposed to assessing how do I feel and comparing that to the metrics that it's providing you, right? And I don't think that that's a fault of yours or anybody else's. I do the same. Everybody, I think that that's literally what it's like programmed to do, and you become reliant on it. And so it's like, I wake up in the morning now, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, how did I sleep? So you check the freaking app, and you're like, how did I sleep? And instead, you know, I used to be, I'd wake up, so I'd open my eyes slowly, look around, do a little assessment, head to toe, like, all right, you know, anything hurt? You know, how am I feeling? Is my head clear? Am I, do I know what I need to do today? You know, it takes like a couple of minutes to sort of, you know, do that inventory. And then you sort of say, all right, oh, I had a great night's sleep. Feel like a million bucks. Or you feel like, shit, I really don't want to get out of bed today. I got to, you know, my head's not clear. I'm not motivated. I don't have energy. Why did I have that second glass of wine last night or third or fourth? And so, you know, whatever it might be. But uh, so anyways, I don't know. I, I have a love-hate relationship uh be, for that reason that that okay it like so i don't know algorithmically i don't know what it's going to do in terms of throwing off my the streak but um but it's unfortunate because it just like it it that's that's what you default to you go oh um, you know oh my score is messed up now it's like i don't actually care about my freaking score i whoop you know what i mean the only thing i actually care about is getting good sleep uh, so I All think right. we're, we, 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 we create, a, a, a you know, it's another abstraction, uh, of something that's really important, but, uh, you know, we use these abstractions to better define them or to measure measures of them. And, and then we abstract them and then we abstract an abstraction and then suddenly we live in a, a world where we're totally disconnected from the important stuff. Huh. So fuck All this right. stuff. All right. Okay. Jen, I want to get your feedback on that. Actually, that's that. And then we don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but let me go ahead and real quick. Last, but certainly not least, we got my homegirl, the one, the only Jen sale, AKA Aussie Osborne, AKA Olivia Newton, Jen, AKA rock. Godile Dundee, AKA Dingo star, AKA the wonder woman from down under AKA Melbourne to be wild. AKA Jen. If you have to ask how much it is, you can't afford it. Cause our stuff never goes on sale. AKA sipping on Jen and juice. What's up? How are you? It's been a minute. How are you living? Good. Yeah. So as our resident wellness and digital wellness expert, what uh, what do you think about something like a whoop or an aura ring? Do you use any of that kind of stuff? So. <laughs> okay. Is that the aura I, ring? Yeah. Um, I thought you were just hanging somebody with a finger. I don't know what, like, I'm like, is that how they do it in Australia? No, she, she, no, she just happened to see you. Australia, Australia is one is <laughs> pointing a finger. I'm like, are you, am I being no. insulted right now? I, I, I definitely, I definitely sympathize with what Drew is saying. I only got this maybe three or four weeks ago and I'd been talking to Amar about, because Amar and Josephina both got the auras. And after about a week, 
I said to him something, I texted him and I was just like, well, I guess I'm obsessed with looking at the data of my sleep every day from now on. Like, yeah. this is what I do now. I wake up and I'm like, what happened last night? But it is strange. Like, I guess it's just, it's just a tool and I guess a little bit of a compass that you can use. Um, but again, I, I'm like, Drew, like, I'll know if I've had a crappy sleep or not <laughs> the night before. So, um, yeah, I tried but, using um, the whoop. Yeah. I tried using the whoop for a little while. It lasted about a week for me and I was like this I just couldn't do it, you know. Part of it I'd work out and the thing would be wet, the band would be like wet and then it's like uncomfortable and Lizzie's the aura ring, and she kind of likes it. I think it's some of the same stuff like where she'll be like it doesn't make sense. Yesterday I did blank and it said this and today I'm doing this and it says yeah. that but none of it like sort of Yeah. checks out. So it's like okay, I, I think to your point, you know, kind of like you're both yeah. saying, like it's a compass more than anything, right? So and I think that's that, that's it. Yeah, with, with the ring that, that I will say, like my little pet peeve about it that I've learnt, um, because they tell you to wear it on your dominant hand on your index finger, um, is ideal. I don't know why, um, but. When one thing that I've found when I'm in the kitchen and I'm using like chef knives, which are pretty dangerous to use, and I'm normally not allowed to use them, by the way, uh, like I'm banned from them. <laughs> but okay. It's like, I'm just like so clumsy. I'm always like dropping things and like I, I'll cut my hand open and things like that. But yeah, so when you're cutting, it's so, it's so, this thing is quite heavy not heavy but chunky and it sits in a funny position so I then have to change hands and just little things like that I I get really like oh it's just yeah. inconvenient but but I mean it, it's in, I do find it interesting looking at that data I don't know how accurate it is because I said to him oh, I was like well, what's your sleep score today? Like I just text him sometimes. I'm like, what was your sleep score today? And he's like, normally I get around, I don't know what he said, like, I don't know, 70 to 80. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he's like, why? Like he was like, what was yours? Or something like that. And I was like, oh, I was really disappointed with a 96. Oh, no. Yeah. It's just like. Amar, just mean, if he's well. doing, <laughs> um, yeah, Amar, I mean, you got no kids, Amar. You got no excuses. 70 to 80 is unacceptable. We're going to have to tell him, make sure that he tunes into the episode. Yeah, we're going to have to, we're going to have to move Josephine into a second bedroom. Oh, they're going to be sleeping in the heat down the hall trying to get a better sleep score. Uh, Leah, do you use any of this kind of stuff? Uh, I just have a normal Fitbit just for heart rate and steps. It's not very good as sleep. Like if I get into bed at eight o'clock and watch something on my laptop, it thinks I'm asleep at eight. So it'll say, congratulations on your 12 hour sleep. (laughs) Uh, is really no good from that point of view but i just have it just to be mindful of keep moving throughout the day and that sort of thing so yeah i think that and this actually will segue well because we're going to talk about domain health right so this is actually domain wellness and uh so this is going to be a good segue i i think kind of to to your point leanne like i you know when i wear my apple watch regularly i think to the extent that the apple watch can track certain things i think is cool because it's like I don't have to, I'm not wearing it specifically to try to track certain stuff that it might not even be tracking well. So it's like, if it can actually do that while serving another function for me, that's kind of, that's sort of the most intrusion I needed in my day to day, like having to switch ring so I could cut chicken and stuff, which is an enormous pain in the ass with the, the kitchen shears, by the way, like cutting, like we do a uh, recipe, grandma's chicken, you know, where we have to cut the chicken up and it's a pain, you know, like, so if I even had to make it that much more of a pain by switching aura rings and things, I don't know, I'm not down, but Hey, like I said, great segue into, we go from personal health and wellness into domain health. So the purpose of this call or, you know, show initially was we had talked a little bit offline. Leanne had tweeted about domain blocking and that, um, some domains had had that she had well, um, actually, I'll kind of just kick it to you. I mean, this was, uh, you know, you tweeted about some domains that having a certain block on them that and and a process by which that you can remove that. Um, and then, you know, that started to die. Well, I think you, you were doing I, I think you were basically doing like I don't remember how often you say you do it, but I think you said maybe twice a year or every quarter you do basically a health check on your portfolio. 
making sure that the domains resolve. Uh, if they don't resolve, that indicated to you that they were uh, in some way blocked or that there was a problem with the DNS, right? And and you had a, you had sort of a checklist, and I think you did a great job of just outlining like, hey, this is what I do, however often you said you do it. And uh, I read it, and I was like, shit, I, I need to basically take that checklist. And then I realized there were some things in there that were a bit more sophisticated than um i was comfortable with and so why not bring you on to uh you know discuss it in more detail like how to properly check on these things and if there is an issue how to deal with it yeah i can only speak to sort of my process and my thinking was a few weeks ago i switched um maybe half my domains to the new ethnic custom lander and i'd heard some problems about them not resolving or whatever when they first launched um, so I'd left it a couple of weeks for those bugs to get ironed out. And then I thought, well, I should check that they resolve. And the only way of doing that is literally to go and visit them all. Um, but sitting there one by one going through them didn't really seem feasible. And I thought I may as well do the whole portfolio while I was there. So I have this um, software called Scrapebox. And there's an add-on for that where it will just visit, visit a page and take a screenshot, save it to a folder. So I just left it running to do that. And then I came to look at it. You can just scroll through the thumbnails and any that aren't, you know, a Dan Lander at a glance or an Afternick Lander at a glance, they just stand out to you. So there was a couple that didn't resolve because I had not changed the DNS. So that was useful. But then I had like seven or eight advanced warnings where the page hadn't even loaded in the first place. Um, and I thought, okay, that's interesting. So then I put those names into virustotal.com and they all came up as blacklisted. And I thought, oh, wait, I sorry. Say, what, what's, the, what's that name again? Uh, virustotal.com. Virus total. Yeah. So you can put in a domain, you can upload a file, um, and it will scan it. Um, and, and this site isn't going to put malware on your computer? <laughs> <laughs> to, to the best of your knowledge. To the best of my knowledge, it wasn't <laughs> by my antivirus, yeah. Um, so, and you can you can literally plug in a list of names and it'll just go and pull and send you thumbnails of all the sites or did you have to do some sort of like special uh you know customization to that well i only had eight that were being flagged so that was okay. quite easy to just manage. Is, is this sim is this similar to something like pentester.com i don't know i don't know that site but it's just um yeah online virus tech so you can upload a file and yeah. it's against all the known um malware and viruses or you can add a domain and it will run it against all the blacklists so it could be email blacklist or it could be a virus or phishing anything like that so um, mm -hmm. so i only had eight to run so i could do them manually and see which lists they were on but they do have an api that is free and as long as you rate limit you can send as many as you want there um wow but i need to brush up i know a little bit about apis but not too much so i think for next time i do it um I would learn that. But I also like yeah. the screenshot aspect because it just shows you what people are seeing when they go to visit it. So it's just instantly clear. Yeah, um, I think that's awesome. So you so virus total is the thing you're using right at the front, like the front end to review all the domains to see that No, works. only the ones with problems to see where the where they're blacklisted. What are you using for the scraping in the language. first place? What was the first thing you're using to pull so, and to create the thumbnails? Um I have a software called Scrapebox. And that oh, okay, has an so. add-on to take screenshots. But there's also Chrome and Firefox add-ons, I think, that do the same thing. You just put in a list. and um, So if you've got, got your name GoDaddy, you want to limit it to like 20, 30 seconds of request, or else it looks like you're just trying to scrape GoDaddy if you're sending, you know, a thousand requests there. So just make sure it's gradual. Um, awesome. All right. So just to kind of slow it down for people like me, the, the, the slower people in the audience, right? So effectively, you're using a tool up front to that's doing a scraping of, uh, you know, effectively taking a snapshot of all the domains, wherever they happen to be living, whatever mm -hmm. the current website is. And then yeah. from there, you're able to look on, do a thumbnail review to then see, hey, which ones are actually not resolving to a landing page. And then from there, then you're using something like Virus Total to then do a, you know, to then do a, an evaluation of the individual names to figure out what it is that needs to be fixed, right? That's right. But with the ones that were blocked, they didn't have a thumbnail at all. It was just um, an Avast pop-up warning mm -hmm. that said, we've stopped you visiting this site because it contains phishing or it contains such and such. 
But okay, an, an interesting thing, I went and checked all these names, and most of them had been for sale over the last year or two before. But I thought, well, they've probably been on the blacklist for a few years because they wouldn't have gone on the blacklist having a GoDaddy lander or a Dan lander. Yeah, yeah. It makes me wonder, people have had this name for sale and dropped it because it's got no interest, but maybe it was never resolving in the first place for them. So they had a name sitting there that they thought was part of their portfolio that at least a vast users weren't able to access. You know, yeah. I think so. This is one of the reasons why this t- interests me so much is that it, 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 most people are hearing what you're saying and they're saying they're seeing a problem. They're seeing an unexpected risk and a problem. I'm listening to what you're saying. And what I hear is opportunity. Because you have domains which are previously not resolving, that couldn't resolve to a lander, where the default who is with privacy, where people couldn't contact the owner, where it didn't have a lander to submit a form, where there was no way to get a hold of whoever owned this domain name. And once you can unblock that and resolve that situation, in my experience, uh, uh, this is where you really find some serious alpha in the domain name business, is when you can unlock a domain name that had been dormant for years, and it was, for whatever reason, there was an impossibility to get a hold of the, the owner because of bad, bad who is, because the domain was blocked, because, you know, uh, whatever. You know, the hosting stopped getting paid 20 years ago, and it's been sitting on the same non-resolution forever. You know, whatever the reason, um, you unlock that, and there's pent-up demand of people who have tried over the years, and you realize that demand pretty quickly i would say there's an i don't know what the numbers are i'm not going to make up numbers but it's a really high percentage of my best sales i've ever made uh came from that situation in one form or another where there was pent-up demand because the domain i acquired was just never before available Mm, Um, so anyway so i think that's a really interesting point that you're making and a lot of opportunity yeah jen yeah i agree it's like the fresh to the market, isn't you it? You raised your hand at one point. Were you going to say something? Exactly. Oh, I, I was just curious. Is the error that the browser's throwing, it, is it specific to like a suspicious website or is it almost like the same error that it will throw if you don't have a like SSL certificate installed these days? No, it came for all of them. It came up and I think it said, we've blocked you accessing this site because it's, it contains malware or it contains oh, yeah. been known to be a phishing yeah. website. So yeah, it was gotcha. a specific yeah. warning for, um, yeah. content on that domain at some point in its life. You know, I don't know when, um, but yes. You know, yeah. yeah. Think- There's another, right. sorry, no, JT, you go. Oh, <laughs> um, I was just going to say, there's another cool tool that we use um, on some of our sites called Uptime Robot. Do you use that at all? Write it down. Um, So that will immediately alert you to if a page goes down like to a 404 or anything like that. So it's also just a good thing, I think, especially on like any of your flagship names. If you've got landers um, installed on them, you can... I guess it will depend on like who you're using for your landers, but for us, I mean, we use our own, so I can put that code on there, but it's, it's definitely been useful because I can even, I'll see if evergreen goes down and I'm like, what's got, like, it will text me as well. So it will send me an email. It'll send me a text and immediately I know that something's going on with the website. So is that a paid service depending how many names you've got on or? Um, it is paid. I don't know what I paid for it, um, but um, yeah, it is a paid service. Um, but I, I haven't really looked into it for a while. It was kind of one of those like set and forget things yeah. for me. Like mm-hmm. I, I, I found it, installed it, and it works. And I was like, cool, <laughs> and I just let it do its thing. Yeah, this is really cool. I'm looking at it now. You, there is a free option. It looks like if you take the pretty, you know, kind of a, the the less the least amount of bells and whistles and whatnot, but there definitely are some paid, not crazy, you know, $7 a month, 30 bucks a month, you know, for all the, you know, different types of monitoring different sites and things. That's pretty cool. I think that's, that's an interesting angle and and tool and way to approach it as well. So I think that's, that's super cool. 
The other thing too, to Drew's point about how it creates opportunity when you realize like, hey, this domain, you know, that has had these issues and perhaps that's why, you know, potential buyers haven't been able to connect and why a name maybe hasn't sold. Um, you know, finding that alpha, the opportunity in the, uh, you know, I think is, is obviously a very cool way of looking at it. Kind of reminds me a bit of just, you know, how you can, there's, there's value to be had in just being able to obtain domains that when you can go chase down a domain that hasn't been available in the market before because it's owned by somebody and maybe somebody died or, you know, it's in the hands of, you know, like a, somebody who doesn't really know a lot about domains. And part of the the value is just being able to make contact, you know, the booths, you know, shout out to Andy and James. They do, you know, a good job of chasing down our to find domains. I mean, we do that when we're trying to do domain acquisitions for clients. So, you know, um, I think that's, and it's super on brand for Drew to be like, you know, where's the, uh, where's the, where's the alpha in that? And uh, so I think that's really cool. Um, all right. So, so let's go back. So now you, you, you see that the domains have some issues. They've been blacklisted, things like that. Then, then what are you doing? Like what's, what, what's next? Um, so most of them were just blacklisted on, on one place. Um, can't remember. I could, I could look it up. Um, and they have a website you can just go on ask for it to be removed and it seems to be automated because everyone I put in I got an email back within about a minute saying that it had been lifted that blacklist had been lifted and then it takes about 24 hours for their systems to sort of flush it out and then it was well I think Avast has to communicate with them to update blacklist as well so um so a day later they were all resolving except one and the one that wasn't was on about five different blacklists and I got it taken off a few and then one said um let us know when there's a website up on it and we'll remove it and i said well it's for sale on godaddy you know it's there won't be a website for years maybe and they just said well let us know when there is and we'll take it off so, so okay, i need to so think when... about what to do with that one really i mean i could just throw up a you know get ai to just do a quick website for me change the name servers get it up taken off go back but i mean it was a hand reg so i'll, I'll I'll do that at some point, but yeah, yeah. So when you talk about where you're going to get them pulled off of the blacklist, like what's an example? Like where where were you doing that at? I'd I'd have to check. But when you go on Virus Total, it gives you a big list in red and blue, and the red ones are where you're blacklisted, and the blue are where it's clean. So it just gave me like for that name um, five. For all the others, it was just the same one. Um, I'll look it up in a second. Uh, so for that, I just googled the website got it removed and then just did the same process for all of them um but so and it, what's the time investment to to get an individual domain removed for the majority that i did it was two minutes you know two minutes just type it in oh wow kind okay. of little, you just That's put crazy. your crazy yeah says, and what, what was the response this, time sorry say again go ahead, Jim. no no go, you go joe it's fine well, I was just asking, what was the response time once you submit it? Thirty seconds. It was like seemed to be. Oh all- wow! It's like yeah. it's like automated. Like instant. yeah, yeah. Oh, I wow. think for the most part, they must run a few checks. But you know, if a name w- was put on the blacklist three years ago, then it's probably quite easy. If, if someone submits it now, that it's a new owner with a new use. Um, I don't know how they it's, do it's, it, or whether it, they just believe you for the first go, and then if it blacklists again, then they look into it. I don't know. Yeah. I- I find it interesting, like, so, like, is this, like, multi-browser affected? Like, is this Mac versus Windows affected? Like, there's just so many different, like, combinations that exist now that I just find it's, it's yeah, like, w- when I'm looking at things like this, I'm like, is this real? Like, and so then I'll, like, go and I'll, I'll check, like, because I've got, like, six browsers installed on my computer. Mm-hmm. Um and and I'll routinely just manually go through and double check them. So is does does their service like t- give you an idea of like like what kind of like you know spread of like blocking is affected That's or? That's a good question. I guess it just depends. So mine were all just I've got a vast stalled on my Windows PC and it was a vast okay. blocking it. So they're pulling a blacklist from somewhere. And you're using that, whether McAfee pull that exact same blacklist, whether I can't think of any others, but whether all the antivirus programs use the exact same set or whether some use that, some don't use that because that's a bit of a false positive or so I can only right. be 
to Avast, but you know, Avast is free and very robust. So I'd imagine use you know has a lot of users. So even if that was twenty percent of people visiting, that could be enough to stop a potential buyer being able to to reach. Sure, so, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I find it interesting about there's a gatekeeping aspect here. You know, where these you know where the the they're able to kind of keep a domain from resolving, right? So you know. Yeah, that's good. I, you know, the choke points that's becomes a very, you know, and, and I think that it's good that they're responsive and remove it and very quickly, because if it's like a lot of things where it can just take forever to get a response or it ends up in some black hole and then, you know, the shit is like kind of messed up forever. Right. Like until, you know, at least they're, resp- you know, um, that's why I think it, it'd be interesting, you know, as we dive in a little bit to see some of, you know, who these the entities are and, but I appreciate that at least they're responsive and quick to to fix it because, you know, once the domain is no longer sort of, you know, sending out spam or whatever the issue was that got it blacklisted in the first place, because, you know, obviously, again, you've got this gatekeeping. If it makes it, you know, not con- functional on the Internet, then it's like that's you know, concerning, obviously, for the domain. So I just how um- many of your names or like what percentage of your portfolio did you find affected? I, you said four or five or? Um, I found about eight names, I think. And I think I put like 2,000 through. So okay. oh, not so huge. Yeah. But again, if that's one name that, you know, would have sold that month, yeah. it's all the difference, isn't it? I just found the black yeah. we're on actually. Um, it's CRDF is what it's called. And they were, they were all on that one. So Avast uses that oh, one. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so... That's the master list that they're all pulling from. That's the data broker, so to speak. It's Avast uses VirusTotal.com and uses yeah. their lists. Um, I don't know about the others, but um, I would imagine it's similar. Yeah, and the C- CRDF uh, Threat Center, right? They're uh, you know it's a f- based in France and Paris, independent, which you know uses technologies to c- combat cybercrime. So. Yeah, that's why I think it's interesting, you know, and I don't know how something like a spam house or, you know, so the, you know, some of these different sort of entities, sites, whatever you want to call them, platforms, um, you know, how they sort of work intertwined, how many, you know, if you've got names that are, you know, so when you run the virus checker, does it let you know where it's blacklisted everywhere? Like how hard is it to get to that, to figure out where you got to go to get it released? Um, so it's as simple as, a vast blocks a name, put that name into Virus Total. Virus Total tells you it's on CRDF and okay. it's on such and such. And then it's a case of visiting those ones. They usually have a section saying, you know, remove my website from this list and you fill it in and, you, and you're done. So, but that's okay. interesting. Based in France, I'm wondering, could it even be regional? Like, yeah, that's what, are yeah. Are they protecting people in the US or do they just protect? Yeah. Them? So that's a, a whole nother layer, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And I also wonder, do they tell you anything about social media networks? Because I've had a couple of like really big names. Uh, I'm just thinking if I can talk. <laughs> um, I've like that Facebook have just like blacklisted the domain name. So yeah. when you try to add the domain name to a business page, the domain name is blocked. So that's a real, yeah, it's happened twice, Drew, to me, and it's wow. taken the first one. The first one took four months to get unblocked and the second one was about two months to get unblocked because those guys work at snail pace anyway and there's no support and you got to know someone there basically. <laughs> um, yeah. But, yeah, it's interesting as well, like for the for the social, I mean, how important social media can be to particular companies and businesses um, and if that domain name is blocked and they've just spent, you know, half a million dollars or a million dollars on a domain name and I, these names, I would, they, they were both valued over a million dollars and they were one word dot coms, dictionary words. They didn't have any like nefarious, like historical anything mm-hmm. um, related to them. But for whatever reason, um, they they were blocked on the bigger social media networks. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, that goes to what I was saying. Oh, go ahead, Leanne. I was just going to say, it's not just about us as sellers. It's us selling a name on that's blacklisted and how 
you know, that doesn't sit well with me and I'm sure it doesn't sit well with anyone. Um, so it's just about doing the due diligence for yourself, but for your buyer so that you're selling something that has no, like, um, yeah, no surprises, right? No negative things that they'll find out about after the fact. But, um, you know, well, and that's kind of the point I was saying before where, you know, you deal with the Facebook or whatever, and it's like getting a hold of somebody to, you know, unblacklist the domain from their system. It's like that good luck, right? I mean, who you're going to go through some big channels and nobody gives a shit. And there's all this you know, sort of process, red tape departments, all this kind of stuff. I appreciate with CRDF and the experience that you had, that they were as responsive and, and it was as, as frictionless as possible because again, you know, the big thing is that these things not being completely sort of, you know, hindered long term. And if there is a, you know, all this friction in trying to get a domain cleaned up, like that's an enormous pain in the ass, you know, and these are really yeah. to me, I look at domains as these like, you know, awesome digital assets. I don't want to see them unfairly impaired you know, in ways that make them not as usable, not as valuable, not as sellable and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, so, so thinking through even like before you, there should watch- be a process that, you know, it, it, it would be an amazing business actually. I mean, uh, especially with all the turnover that there is in the, in the startup world and, um, like, you know, kind of like how in the credit system you have bankruptcy and there are different mm-hmm. chapters of bankruptcy, law it'd be interesting to like be able to run like a uh, almost like a uh uh um uh what is the word a um um, reputation bankruptcy on a domain name meaning like okay this domain is now with a new party it runs a process that verifies that it is an arm's length different party you basically are starting from scratch or you know there's the chapter whatever is you start from zero there's chapter whatever which is basically like a soft start which is okay, you're, you're going to maintain some of the domain authority and some of the positive stuff, but we're going to wipe away all the, you know, spam and, you know, spammy backlinks and whatever and, and negative authority, you know, it, it, that'll be interesting. And, and it should exist. That should exist. Um, uh, because that's the reality of the life cycle of domain names. Um, they change hands. You have a new user. That person has no authority over what happened to it in the past they have no way to affect what happened to it in the past most people don't even have the skills or the knowledge to analyze what did happen with a domain name in the past prior to purchasing it and um you know so that'd be a really interesting tool that i feel like leanne is super well equipped to go build <laughs> and then let us and then give us access free access yeah just let us invest in it <laughs> oh yeah that's and then we're gonna sell it and then we're gonna sell it to google yeah, there you go. Um, but no, I think because when we talk about domain yeah, hype, right? trillion dollars. Media Options is the industry's leading domain broker specializing in domain acquisitions, high value domain sales, and domain name consultation. As pioneers and thought leaders on the subject of the domain aftermarket and domain name value, plus through their clear domain acquisition service, Media Options offers startups and established corporations an unparalleled scope of high value domain options, providing access to domain names and curation technologies not available elsewhere. Media Options believes in the power of a great domain name and is dedicated to helping you obtain yours. Call or email today to put a domain to work for you. We talk about domain health, right? So we're talking about the ability for a domain to resolve to a website, right? And that's obviously how you, uh, Leanne, for this particular exercise, were identifying the domains that had issues because they weren't resolving, right? And then that mm-hmm. sends you down the rabbit hole to figure out why the unblocking, and then now the you know the names are resolving, and uh, and obviously there's a lot around that, and and tons of questions and and stuff, but pretty cool how you had to go through that, and super interesting. What are we'll some go through a similar? Oh, well, real quick. All right, go ahead, go ahead, and then I'll finish up what I was gonna do to segue into the next thing. But well, ahead. I thought you were just playing, Mister. I just thought you were playing repeat, <laughs> Mister Rogers. Are you gonna say like, yeah, you know, you're, like you're gonna be breaking my down, shoes off, putting the sweater on, repeat you know? four different ways. No, I well, I just wanted to, you know, highlight maybe what are some of the other, you know, you don't have to go through all of it, but just what are some of the other critical things that you're checking when you're doing, because uh, I think you created like a fairly automated system for analyzing this sort of portfolio, right? Um, what are some of the critical things you're checking for? Obviously, name servers, right? You know. Yeah. I mean, there's things there's that a- I'll check before I buy a name, but then just in terms of portfolio hygiene, I'll kind of 
not go too deep. I'll just do this this sort of process maybe every six months, um, and then buying a name, checking the DNS history, checking on Wayback Machine if it's had you know Chinese casino sites that kind of things on it. It doesn't really. I mean, I still buy the name most of the time, but it's just kind of good to know of if it's been for sale before or if it's been spammy before or anything like that. Yo, it's wild how many Chinese casinos exist. Uh-huh. <laughs> I feel like there's like one per person. Yeah, everybody's yeah, got I- their own casino. Um, so what I was going to say was that, all right, so, you know, going through that health check, you're really looking to see if the site resolves or if there are any issues around it resolving. What about email, right? I think that's got to be, you know, and, and I think that's one that we deal with where, you know, I think it's pretty high priority as far as trying to make sure that names that you're acquiring or names that you have don't have issues that will make it on, you know, make the make email not work with it. Right. So, I mean, that's obviously a critical aspect. We were talking offline before we started the conversation about DMARC and that kind of thing. So what about email delivery? Is there, are there things you can do with a name when it's only for sale simply, or are there ways that, you know, red flags that are raised to know when you have that site or is it is, is for email purposes really only once you start using a domain like in business with an email address that you find out that you have some undeliverable type of situ- type of issues. It's an interesting point. I think that's something that we could do with portfolios and when buying names of to check that side of things as well. So if you just run it through spam house or um, I, I can't think of exact names, but there's sites you can go to check if you're on a blacklist for email deliverability. So virustotal.com is more about whether the website's been infected, but then there's other websites that will check if you're on um, mail server blacklists. And for those in my experience, from when I used to do web design, there the removal is automatic on those as well. So you'll just put in the domain you want removed and it'll remove it. I think if you're a repeat offender, that's when things um, are problematic. But if there's been no activity on it for months or years and then you ask for it to be removed, it's just removed. Um, so, yeah, that's an interesting point. Just It doesn't affect us as domain sellers, but it's just something nice for the buyer that they're not inheriting something or you know buying something that isn't they can't use straight away because they would have to take care of these issues and just look sketchy if you're selling those kind of names. Okay. But DMARC and everything is something you can only do when you own the domain. So you can't do that on a on a buyer's behalf preemptively. And then for DMARC, is is has, has there have there been changes recently or some new implementation of stuff? Because I feel like now it's you know was it a Google update? Like what has made DMARC you know more of an issue recently? True. Yeah, it's, it's Google. They updated uh, their. Um, spam threshold so i think now if you get a, i think it's one in a thousand if one of one in a thousand of your messages gets marked as spam then you they'll kill the email address basically um which is obviously a really low threshold so yeah. that was that was new a couple of months ago i think I, it's Two yeah it's so crazy so and that's what it is it's one in a thousand is the new mm. google threshold for spam I, th- I think that's more gmail like Gmail on a Gmail address. I think if you use custom domain and if you've got your DMARC, DKAM, SPF, all of that set up, they may be a little bit more forgiving, but they kind of haven't, they've just put that one in a thousand out there and they haven't been too specific about, you know, where the needle falls either side of that. They just, they just let you know that they're watching what is the google's got a black box yeah. approach to it's just, well it, it, it's, it's like it's like the ir it's like how the irs approaches taxes it's like look we're gonna, this is so complicated nobody understands it and so we're gonna let most of that slide but if we want you there's uh, there, there's zero people who are 100 percent in compliance and so we're gonna put our thumb on you well and, 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 and that's I'm google's approach that. Well, yeah, and then they obviously that's always been, you know, the secret sauce of search engine optimization and everything else has always just been this like, you know, sort of ambiguous thing of like, you know. Um, it is weird that like the whole, if you think about the entire digital ecosystem is dependent on some man behind the curtain bullshit. You know what I mean? It's just, it is wild. It is really wild. So, so then for DMARC, um, so, so what's the approach then? Is you like you said? So, can I ask a specific question in regards to DMARC? So, we have this is an issue that touches me personally because 
Uh, Chris is on a rampage telling me, I mean, you know, he's in sales and obviously his whole life in the world of domain brokerage relies upon email delivery. And so rightfully so he's, uh, all over me about, you know, I don't know if our DMARC is correct. And I'm like, look, I don't know. He's got some third party tool he used. I couldn't tell you what that was, but it told him that something was incorrect about our DMARC. I rely on Cloudflare. We use Cloudflare in between, you know, our host and, um, uh, D- Cloudflare has a, uh, I-, I say new, it might not be new, uh, DMARC tool. And so when you go in there, you click the DMARC tool, you activate DMARC, I- Cloudflare controls our entire DNS. And so I assume when I click it, uh, you know, click the DMARC button and it says DMARC, cool, you're good. <laughs> DMARC, I'm, good. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm good. Is that naive? Are there additional things? Are there customizations in that text record that should be done? Are there what 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 what's what's you know best practices on on DMARC? Well, the situation you described should just be you know if they're implementing a one click DMARC setup, that's what it should be. So there's third party websites you can go to check your DMARC and it will tell you what the errors are. But it's not just DMARC; you also need DKIM setup. Um, which you get keys from Google, I want to say. Yeah, if they're hosted, yeah. yeah. And uh, SPF records. So you need those three um, all working together to make it through to the inbox. Um, so if you're me, you're a complete Luddite as it applies to uh, implementing any form of technology. Uh, what would you do? Uh, to verify that my DKIM, my DMARC, and my and my SPF records are all, you know, let's say optimized to the fullest. I just there's third party websites that will just check it for you. You put your domain in or your email address, and it will just go and say your DKIM isn't set up, your SPF isn't set up. There's this error with that, and then just action any points that that come through. You heard that, JT? I did. Yeah, it's all good. I'm making a lot of notes I, today. I want, I want a whole bunch of action and, and reports. You know what I'm saying? A, a lot whole of bunch of action and reports. Um, actions and reports. Actions and reports. All kinds like of actions it. and reports. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jen, so for you guys, like, because obviously, you know, you've got Evergreen, and then I don't know if you're doing anything for the domains that are in the portfolio, but what are you guys doing from a DMARC or an email? Health. I know you. You know you mentioned Uptime Robot as a way to keep an eye on some on the the sites and potentially the domains. Uh, what about from an email perspective? Have you guys had issues from Evergreen? I mean, we run into some stuff around media options just because you know we're we're selling, obviously. But what about you guys? I, I, I mean, I think yeah, I think when it does come to a name like Evergreen dot com, that does have history behind it, and um. You know, there are a lot of people that want that name to this day. Um, nah, come on, we, be honest. Nobody wants that. <laughs> there, there's no fire for Evergreen. No way. <laughs> um, but we we have. I mean, one of the biggest issues that I did have once was we got spoofed pretty bad, and someone sent something like fifty thousand emails underneath our. Yeah, at, like so it was completely not us sending it and if they're very good at spoofing, they can trick a lot of the platforms until the platforms come up with whatever these like the black hat hackers are into. Um, but, um, yeah, that was an interesting day for my inbox, um, <laughs> I will say. Oh, yeah. um, but, I mean, yeah. Was it just since one day? Then, I mean, I, mean we, I would think that would have been a pain in the ass for a little it, longer. Than it, that. Went over, it went for about a week. but. Um, we, I, we work closely as well with, um, Frank Mishlik, who, um, he's really well versed in all of this, as you would know, JT, a you've big known shout him out to for Frank, a while yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Big shout out Frank. Um, yeah. So Frank, um, he's awesome and, um, he's always, always on top of our stuff. Um, keeping a close eye on all of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, well, I, you know, and I think this all kind of plays into the idea of domain health, right? And I think when we're, we're, we're looking at it from two lenses, one being 
as website operators ourselves, right? For our home pages and, you know, for our main sort of our businesses. And then, you know, then from a domain investment perspective, you know, we've all got portfolios, right? So it's just trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way to stay on top of that kind of stuff. And I think that, you know, Leanne, you know, your point about, you know, sort of this domain hygiene check that you're doing, you know, on us, you said about every like twice a year, maybe you're going through and just doing some kind of a scan of the portfolio, make sure things, you know, it sounds like Jen, do you guys use uptime, uh, the uptime robot on names and just other names in the portfolio or are you using it just for evergreen or, or how? Um, I've got it on, I've got it on just, um, like a selection of our like flagship names, the, the bigger gotcha. ones, just to okay. keep an eye on them. Um, because yeah, I think we've now, we're at about 25,000 under management and brokerage. So, um, autom- I mean, that could be automated, but, um, uh, also with those longer tail, um, names, that are probably valued in the four to fives. It's a like I'm okay to like let that slide at at the moment, but um, but yeah, it's really for the bigger ones that Got I, I want to keep an eye on those. Yeah. All right. Well, very very cool. I mean, and then there's plenty of other stuff, and I don't think we need to necessarily get into like you know a main due diligence checklists and whatnot when you're acquiring a domain, but we could probably, I mean, we could talk about that for a few minutes. So Leanne, when you're looking to buy a name, um, so you're checking domain health. Are there any other pieces to that that kind of stand out as anything you're preemptively looking at to make sure that you're not buying a, you know, bill of goods, like a, you know, domain that has a whole bunch of problems beyond what some of the stuff we've already talked about? Yeah, I can't think of anything that we haven't already talked about. So in the past, I haven't really done much at all, maybe way back machine just to see what's going on. But like I say, I tend to ignore that anyway, unless it's something really nasty. But moving forward, I I check um, virustotal.com for each name I'm going to buy just to see if I'm, because if it's on, you know, 10, 20 different lists and I'm looking to hand reg it, it's not, it's not worth my time to get it removed from all of those. So um that's the kind of thing I'll look out for, but I know from the ones I've done, which some are just super easy, like I say, a couple of minutes to just type the name in and fire it off and get it removed. Um, so I'll check on that um, and yeah, just see if it's been for sale before, but in terms of looking for anything nasty there, they're the only points that I'm I'm doing now and that's because of the work I did a few weeks ago and what that highlighted. Sure. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. Since the last time you came on, how uh, how are you doing from a portfolio perspective? Has, has your portfolio grown? Has your sales increased? Have you, you know, how, what what are you what, what are you measuring that you're trying to improve? Um, so yes to both. Just trying to roll up as many sales as I can into the portfolio to grow that. So yeah, that's grown. Um, it was a really quiet summer, and then the last week of August, I just got loads of sales. Just. I kind of thought because I'd been at the London Domain Summit talking to people there and, you know, people were saying, how's the summer? I was like, yeah, it's quiet, it's quiet. And then the day I got back from there, I just got like three sales in a day. And I thought, has someone on this conference like found my portfolio (laughs) pity on me or something? Because (laughs) that was really weird. Um, uh, so yeah, Sa- domain sa- domain sales just have a funny way of coming in batches, though. That that that's always been my experience. Just, yeah, you know, it'll, it'll you'll have a dry spout, and then all of a sudden, it, you know, big batch, and you know, you got this uh, the old saying when it rains, it pours. And it's just yeah, yeah. That's that it. might be just might just be the way the universe works. Yeah. Yes. So for those sales, um, are those coming off of your own like your landers? Where do you um like where do you have them? Where where do those domains like where are the sales coming from? Yeah, so I just a couple of weeks ago moved pretty much all of my domains to the new GoDaddy custom lander. Just so in preparation for Dan finishing, I didn't want to leave it till the last minute. I wanted to, you know, get used to managing everything on after Nick. And um, so, yeah, they've all come since I did that, really. But it's too soon, I think, to say whether it's because of that. But um, I think one was from the lander and a couple were from the reg path. So we'll just see how the next few months go now that summer holidays are finished and uh after nick boost that goes live like today right is that the deal this week okay yeah so are you boosting your names 
I'm yeah, I'm boosting. I'll, I'll boost till the end of the year, and then I'll have some data to work with to see how it worked for me. Because if I don't boost, I'm just left wondering. And okay. I'd rather. Well, that's an interesting. Oh, uh, but that's that's you know that's the whole psychology of it. <laughs> if I don't boost, I'm just left wondering. But <laughs> that's it. That's that's where they get you. But I want to. That's where they you. get you. And then you know I have. I have a reference point of how it's going. And yeah. if I think, oh, I'm selling too many, I'm paying too much commission, then I can yeah. tell, or I'd just rather know how it's performing I have, before, I, before I opt out m- or don't. M- more power to you. I'm excited to see, and thank God, you know, that people like you are out here sharing data and you will, you know, I'm sure analyze it, you know, in depth and, and you know, I hope we can all benefit from your results. I just on principle, I really find the commission gouging to be obtuse and uh, it's too much for me. And uh, I'm sorry. I, you know, AXJ, you my man. I love you. Uh, AXJ. Nick, you get, uh, after Nick, you know, like, yo, check yourself. You know what I mean? Like, come <laughs> on. 15% is enough. Okay. It's enough. Stop. You don't need 20. You don't need 25%. If I, I, you know, just stop, stop, you know, people need to eat. Jen, what are your thoughts? You guys, uh, do you guys, uh, is, is everything homegrown landers for you guys? Like where are you guys, where are you have, uh, I didn't even realize you had that many names now, which is crazy, but what, um, what are you guys doing? Um, yeah, we've, we've got a, we got a good chunk on our landers um mostly though yeah like i said mostly the flagship names um and then a bunch we have on like cedo custom landers that we got them to customize years ago i don't even know if they do it anymore um but it's it it has a banner on there that comes directly to us. Okay. The inquiries. Um oh, nice. and yeah, I I I'm not, I'm not sure if they if they do that anymore. Um Yeah. So I don't really have a comment on any of the GoDaddy pricing. <laughs> no, I'm with it. So you guys don't use Afternick at all? Yeah. Pardon? You don't use Afternick at all? Um well, not in any meaningful way, anyway. You know, maybe a couple straggler type names or something. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see. And Leanne, I'm very curious to see how the uh, the experiment goes for you over this these next few months to see if do you see an uptick in sales and uh, you know, and, and then how do you manage that? You know, we we always say you know domains are like snowflakes, right? They're so unique and it can be tough at times because you're trying to measure data that matches actual apples to apples and stuff. But the um, <clears throat> but it'll be interesting to see if you see some big, huge uptick justifying paying extra versus this idea that, you know, you've got to pay extra just to maintain status quo, which, you know, and, and and credit to a lot of the folks on Twitter and people who aren't following, you know, there's definitely people who share information and some of the, you know, and even just the different sort of like breakdown of how many more names you need to sell in order to make sure that you're still taking home the same amount of you know proceeds overall right like in order to continue to make the same amount of cash how many more sales do you need to make and where is the break even point and all that kind of stuff to justify you know doing this new program which is you know supposed to be better or is it really just the same really you really know i it, it, I'm I'm really interested to see how this all plays out. And again, I just you know I have to rely upon people like you guys uh, who are going to analyze it and and put it out there, you know, in, in an unbiased way. But my personal feeling has always been, and my, I might just be a dinosaur on this because Chris certainly thinks I am, and Billy thinks I am. But um, I have never really believed that marketing is a you know certainly at the margin there's always a a, 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 but marketing is a very difficult thing in the let's say domain name aftermarket i think because nobody cares about domains they just don't care nobody cares until the very moment when they suddenly need to care 
because it was their idea or they run into a problem or they meet you know, whatever some day comes they need the domain they then face this dilemma of buying it and you know the negotiation the finding it or whatever whatever their 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 experience is that they go through whether it's a registering a domain buying it in an auction getting a broker what, whatever their process is and then they either succeed or they fail, and then they never, they literally again don't care about a, their domain. They, they, they forget it. Like it goes into the registrar account. And that's it. I mean, I have an email. People go there on the web, but then nobody thinks about their domain. And so there's marketing for a company like a GoDaddy to be a holistic domain name services provider. So you you put your domain with us, and we give you all these services where you can manage your stuff, and that's what 99% of people need. Fine. But if you're trying to resell a domain name, I don't know how I don't know how broad marketing is going to be an effective tool. I, mean, I think 80% of the people already know the domain they want. And so they're going to check it and they're going to land on a lander. And so having a good lander, I think, uh, is important. I think that you can optimize landing pages. I think there's a lot of things you can do and things that you shouldn't do to attract or deter a buyer on your landing page. But I don't know, and I, I really am welcome to being wrong. I think Darpon has been writing some interesting stuff about this, a little bit about their strategy and how he's pivoted. And you know, I had commented early on about some of their marketing strategies, how I just think it's a waste of money. I think I don't think it's improving outcomes. Um, I can see in their case where a lot of their business is people who are actually searching for a name. And so maybe promoting their service, which brings people into the marketplace to you know use their let's say um value added domain search uh to identify a potential fit for them for their for their ne naming needs but again 80 percent, i think roughly 80 percent. i think frank Schilling had voiced a similar uh uh expectation uh of people buying domain names already know the domain they want even if it's on a list of domains they want they, they, they already know and they go to that domain and then that domain redirects to a marketplace or that domain is as a landing page it's from a parking company or a marketplace or it's an individualized lander or it forwards to your whatever linkedin social media whatever it might be that person then makes a decision about whether to contact you directly or to uh contact you through a marketplace that they trust whether that's a sato or a godaddy or an afternet or a dan or Whatever it might be that they've had, you know, a recommendation on or uh, awareness of, but I don't think that putting out a domain, particularly a high-end domain, and saying, you know, uh, I don't know, tread.com is for sale, and putting that out on blast on social media or LinkedIn or Facebook, I, I don't, I don't know that that's attracting any serious buyer who is qualified, interested. And is let's say you're catching them at that very minute moment in time when it matters. Yeah, I don't know how you can possibly align all three of those things in any sort of campaign uh, marketing your domain. Now, if you've identified a buyer and you're doing super hyper targeted market marketing using their zip code and using you know that's a different animal. Okay, but if you're just trying to say I want to increase visibility, I want to attract a buyer. I don't find it attractive. I don't think that it's going to be effective. I'm very interested to see. I'm very open to being proven wrong. I, my belief, my hypothesis, uh, untested hypothesis, that has basically kept me from spending money over the years, uh, arguably for the better, because uh, I think a lot of my competitors have wasted a lot of money doing a bunch of marketing. But um, I think that... Uh, I think that this boost thing is going to be ineffective because GoDaddy already has an established brand. It's probably the go-to already for the vast majority of the people that are saying, hey, I need a domain. One of the play first places they're going to go check is some variety of services from GoDaddy through some channel or another, or they're going to land on a landing page, which you know just by um, probability is going to be a GoDaddy landing page of some sort. And so... Um, I think they've already got that market share, right? And certainly they can improve it to, you know, marginally, but but not, you know, grasp a whole new market. And I don't think that the boost, I don't, I, I just don't know who that's 
targeting? Who who is the other end of that marketing campaign that they're bringing in that wouldn't have otherwise found that name, right? Like if you run through the scenarios, you know, Chris, I, I won't reiterate it here, but Chris does a great job thinking about there's five types of buyers. And we've gone through this front to back 55 times. There are five types of buyers. I promise you, there are no exceptions to that. There's five types of buyers. That's it. There's only five reasons they buy, period, full stop, end of story. And so is one of those buyers and one of those buyer types on the end or end of that marketing campaign? And I failed to identify which one. So um, I think there's exceptions, of course. But again, I don't think you could build a business playing on the exception. You want to build a business playing on the rule. Uh, unless the exception is big enough to to build a business on, but um, I don't know. We'll see. We shall see if I'm flat right or flat wrong. But when you talk about marketing, do you mean the email marketing that they'll do? Because I think the main aspects of Boost are the the verified and or was it premium badges on the landers? Yep, verified br- badges on the and- exact match searches for fast transfer names. Verified mm-hmm. badges on the domain landers higher visibility in the search results, and then some targeted email marketing campaigns are basically the four things that they highlight, you know, in their blog article when they announced or when they've, you know, promoted what they're doing. Okay. So the email uh, marketing campaign would be Can I just say something? Uh, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, 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 like I haven't looked into the boost thing too much because it's not really on my radar, but um, but just listening to this is interesting. Um, I, I kind of have the same thought, God, thinking the same as Drew, but, um, you I heard it here first, it. folks, oh, no. Look, ladies, and gentlemen, oh, no. ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first, mark this moment I, on your I, calendar. You, will you didn't even want to holiday. say it, the words out of her mouth. She was like, as she was it, saying, it was, was like, like vinegar. Introvert. It was like vinegar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was vinegar. Um, but. <laughs> I, I, I'm um, I'm I'm just thinking similar to these like verified badges. Like so, there are only going to typically ever be a handful of suitable buyers per domain name if they've come to this name and there's a verified badge on it. And really, most people only buy one to a handful of names for their business in their lifetime. What does a verified badge mean to an end user? Correct. I don't think I. I, I think it's window dressing right i think Wait, compa- it's- compared to if the if there wasn't a badge because they wouldn't know if there was a badge or there wasn't a badge like yeah. they just want to buy and the it, domain it, name yeah. the funny badges thing on the landers you might as well say like you know call it some other like some other again window dressing right this is an exclusive premium domain right. as opposed to a super premium domain like who cares now if they're calling them out differently and, and, and once somebody's well, identified that this is the domain that they want i i don't i just yeah. don't i don't know well, that matters I mean. any of that matters and there's no way to A-B test it. It's impossible to A-B test because, as we always say, domains are a snowflake. And so you can't compare one to another. You, every buyer is different. Every scenario, every, every you know, let's say, package of, of, of criteria and um, uh, situational variables are different. It, it, you can't compare it. You can't do A-B testing. So well, I would say that this really only applies to, in my opinion, your lower to mid range like names because i definitely think that there is value in properly marketing a premium lander when you are like on the seller side brokering or selling it yourself and it's you know a seven figure plus domain name i think there is value in 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 marketing in those situations but i don't necessarily think that value lies in the platforms i think that's when you work with a premium broker who knows how to market that name properly um but that's just my two cents yeah no i I mean there's so there's a couple of things interesting things in here one you know they they base it off of the you know it's called the justification you know they ran the pilot program on participating portfolios on godaddy over the course of a six month window from June or from January to June of this year and said, Hey, it resulted in a 10% increase in sales, right? Now we don't know exactly what that means, but you know, 10% increase in participating portfolios. So therefore we're going to now roll it out as an option for everyone. 
and you only have to pay us 5% more, but it makes 10% more. So everybody wins kind of thing. Right. And now it's, it's interesting because I think there are a few different dynamics at play. One is like, okay, if they are going to be now highlighting the names that are participating in boost, the other names, are they now naturally put at a disadvantage? Right. And I think to the point about the verified badge, the, the one thing I just wasn't sure, I know a verified badge on a lander to me doesn't really mean much, right? I think that at the end of the day is not going to really change much. It's just a different sort of emblem logo. You could put whatever whatever kind of artwork you want on a lander. To me, it's just more window dressing. The uh, But they say verified badges on exact match searches for fast transfer domain. So I just don't know if that means, you know, again, you're talking exact match searches. So now that's sort of a similar sort of semi like lander step where... Am I seeing but a again, list of names? Again, JT, what does fast transfer mean to an end user? A hundred percent. No, no, no. I totally get it. When you're talking about, and, I, and I'm going to get to that piece here in a second too. I, I'm just saying like, if now if you're showing a list of domains and some have a badge where some don't, maybe that, you know, and if, but now like to the point that you know, started with Drew and you're following up because you, know, you guys live in the same space. When you're talking about super premium domains, somebody wants to buy a particular domain. They're not saying, hey, sell me on which name I want. They're just saying, what's the process by which and how much is it going to cost me to get this name? That's it. And if the price fits in their budget, all the rest of the stuff doesn't matter at all, right? Then it's just a process piece of, okay, then let's just get into escrow. Let's do what we do. When we get it, let me put my IT guy in the room now on the conversation so that we can you know, get all the details worked out for the transfer and everything else. The rest of it doesn't matter at all. So now we get into this other piece about the targeted uh, you know, higher availability in, in suggested search results, which... Less about a particular name and more about those names you mentioned in that five thousand, ten thousand, maybe dollar range where somebody's like, "All right, I have an idea for a business. I have a general thought of like what I want to theme the branding around. Now I need to go find myself the right domain name, right?" So now preferential treatment in searches, higher visibility, maybe results in a sale that would have otherwise gone to a different name, right? Um, and then the other piece that I find interesting, and this is to something Drew touched on briefly when he talked about DARPEN, is the idea of this email marketing. Because now they're like, oh, well, we're also going to do targeted email to potential buyers, right? And it's like, what does that mean? Like, are you guys going to be using, you know, data that you have related to customers that have X, like similar names in their GoDaddy account that now you're going to send them an email? Like, because they've, or, or if they've got a dot, you know, a dot net to a dot com type of campaign, you know, hey, you've got the dot net of this domain. Do you want to buy the dot com? Do you want to upgrade? Like, you know, so what does that look like? And the reason I mentioned the DARPON piece, because I think it's really interesting, his, you know, their approach with Adam spending money on social, spending money on 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 marketing domains. And occasionally they have highlighted a name to say, hey, we sold this domain based on a specific ad campaign that went out around that domain. It was a response to an ad campaign. And Drew's point is that that doesn't really happen very often, right? Because people want a name well, when they want a name. It, I, not only does it not happen often, I would say it's the exception and not the rule. I would be very careful about interpreting those results in that way. Meaning, so if I, let's say I'm a qualified buyer and I've gone to xyz.com and now I've got some kind of cookie because I visited that domain name. It's got a, a an Adam lander on it. Now Adam goes out and they do a campaign to market uh, xyz.com. I'm going to automatically get that marketing campaign. I click on the marketing campaign. It, whenever I make my acquisition, which I was already going to make, that the result what they, what what they're going to interpret that as is oh this marketing campaign sold this domain name. But no, I had already made up my mind I'm going to buy this domain name. And because I visited it before, I got shown your campaign because the cookie followed me and um, or the cookie caused your ad to follow me. And then I clicked the ad because it's relevant to me, but it didn't influence whether or not I bought the domain. It just cost you extra, just became yeah. a cost of goods sold. So um, I don't know. I I'm I'm skeptical. I've were I've gone through this for you know it's been a long time. I've been thinking about this. And Chris is, you know, adamant that that the marketing, you know, would be beneficial. I'm adamant that it would not. You know, we've done a few different experiments to sort of flush this out. I've yet to see see anything that was convincing to me that it was, you know, useful in any way whatsoever. Um, I think if you're advertising broadly a service like, oh, we're a domain broker. And if you need a domain broker, we can help you. Totally get it. 
absolutely. I don't know, you know, other than word of mouth, that's how you got to get out there, I guess. But um, to say we are selling XYZ.com and then thinking that my broad marketing, like, I, I don't know. I, I don't, again, yeah. I, I'm not saying again, it, I think it comes or down to when you doesn't happen, but it's a lot of wasted money, um, I think, for 80% of those. I will say, I think that on, and, and I agree with the, with the mid range names, but with the ultra premiums, and I know we're probably not even talking about that right now. We, we, we will invest and spend money on like, and you would have seen some of our landers that like the custom landers we've created for very high, the higher end names. But, yeah, yeah, but that's different. That, well, because yeah, your just, your target oh, audience is coming to you anyways, but are you you are you spending money on outbound like social media marketing or you know um, like broad let's have. say broad broad like targeted marketing I get, but broad marketing I don't I don't get that's the part I'm, I'm no no pushing. so we don't I, I definitely I agree that I no longer do I don't think press releases I think that they're just a thing of the past it's a waste of money. Yep. And they yeah. charge a lot. Um, I don't think that um, search ads work. I've tried those. I haven't gotten any luck there. The only thing that I found with the ultra premium names was that if I have a really nice lander on there, it looks quality, it looks legit, um, it opens doors. So it instills some kind of like trust and authority with if I'm dealing with a Fortune 500 so they can see also, that who I am saying I am selling this. So whether or not you're the owner or you're a broker or whatever, um, it verifies identity and things like that as well. So there are a few things that it ticks a box. But I would say and agree with you, this really only applies to ultra. I hate saying ultra premium. Can we come up with something else? Because I just don't like well, that. It's like term. a verified badge. You know, you can call it whatever you want. It just dresses it up. It's all the, it's the same thing. You know what I mean? It's a super terrific, fantastic premium. It's, a, an F- it's, it's like an STF all premium. Natural. Did, did you know, did you know, it's a public, <laughs> public service announcement, and then we can, you know, wrap this up. But did you know that the word all natural is not regulated at all? You could, you can call something all natural. It can be literally made from, you know, synthetic freaking plastic and uh, you can call it all is natural. It and there's nothing anybody can do. That's that's funny, Drew. Do, is it true that at one point when McDonald's first released their 100% beef patty, they it wasn't 100% beef, but they trademarked 100% beef so they could call it 100% beef patty? Is that true? I, I, I think know. I remember hearing something. We've like been that. having conversations about this, though. Like, you got to be careful what you put. So this is a great way to bookend both pieces of this conversation because we're talking <laughs> about health, right? We talked about domain health. We talked about personal health in the beginning with the or and the, and the whoops and stuff. And uh, we've been having a lot of in, in dialogue in our house about just the stuff you put in your bodies and how bad some of these chemicals are. Somebody yesterday, we were, I was talking to a buddy. He was like, have you ever thrown a, a Twizzler on a fire? The shit doesn't burn, you know, or if you've taken McDonald's and you take a McDonald's hamburger and you just put it on a shelf in the back, like in your office, a year from now, that shit's still going to look like a hamburger. It doesn't break down. There's no like, cause it's not even, it's so chemically treated. You can pour Coca-Cola on paint on a car. It'll wear the paint off the fucking car. So it's like, you're going to drink. They use it to remove blood stains in the highway after like, you know, fatal accidents. <laughs> Coca Cola, like, Coca Cola cleans coins. Like it, that's what you know, I'm it, saying. It cleans coins. Like, why would you put that in your body? I anyway. <laughs> you know, because I'm trying to get rid Don't of the rust it. inside. You know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to clean my stuff out. Anyway, hey, look, um, we covered a lot of ground. I just want to thank you guys. This was great. We're running up on time. Leanne, thank you so much. Jen, thank you so much. Drew, as always, um, really, really appreciate you know, going through and being able to touch on all these different topics. We covered some pretty, pretty cool stuff. I hope the audience enjoyed it. Um, you know, the thing about the, uh, I want to keep an eye, you know, obviously the, the afternoon boost, you know, interestingly, I want to, you know, I, I'm curious to see with Adam and some of their, their, you know, marketing, their broad based marketing and to see what kind of results that continues to have. Interesting thing is even if it is a, you know, an ad that goes out that relates to a sale, the good news for Adam is that Andrew Miller will still take credit for it, you know? So that's cool. 
Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, <laughs> ah, it's all love. It's all love, but, um, but, uh, but also true. And, uh, and Hey, to the audience, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I think there was a lot of, we'll probably throw some of these links and names and, and tools and things in the show notes. Uh, we, you know, we'll continue to stay on top of this kind of stuff. There's more to follow and uh, more, more things that we can dig into, but thank you all for tuning in. As we say on the show without you, there is no us. So thank you so much. And, uh, thanks for jumping down the rabbit hole with us today. And, uh, and we'll see everybody next time, uh, here on domain Sherpa, where all roads lead to domains. Peace out y'all.